Oh my God, I can relax. I've been so worried about going up those stairs. <laughs> right. oh, it's awful. Um, but you guys can relax too because the title of my talk is God is in the Internet, but I want you to know I'm not going to be talking about religion for the next 10 or 15 minutes. What I'm going to be talking about is a series of experiences I went through personally that led me to think differently about technology, social media, the digital space, and how they all work together with humanity. And I hope by the end of my talk you'll think differently about it as well. In March of 2014, Time Magazine came out with an article called, How Much Time Have You Wasted in Facebook? And for a variety of reasons, that article completely wore me out. But I went ahead and did their exercise, and I found out that I had spent 28 days, 2 hours, and 52 minutes wasting time in Facebook. And actually, after looking at their algorithm and some of the averages they were using, I'm going to say I would round that up to maybe 29 or even 30 days because, you know, I spent a lot of time in social media. But I want to go back to a story of something that happened in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Um, there was a hotel near my house being remodeled, and a ton of families were being displaced. It was close enough to being finished that they went ahead and just turned it into a refuge for those families. My sister and I decided to go by and drop off a bunch of DISD, Dallas School District, uniforms because um, the kids were going to be able to go to Dallas schools, and we didn't want them to stand out. We wanted all the kids to, you know, just look like they fit in. So um, when we got there, buses were unloading with people, and what happened was a woman got off the bus, and she was carrying a child, but she wasn't carrying it in a motherly way. She was carrying it in this, like, kind of foreign object way, and she was saying, this is not my baby, this is not my baby, this is not my baby. And what had happened was when she was leaving New Orleans, someone had handed her a baby to take to safety because they were afraid they weren't going to be able to get on um, one of the buses. And I'd had my son Cooper earlier that summer, and I was just completely haunted thinking of a mom on the other side of the equation that was standing there empty-handed saying, where's my baby, where's my baby, where's my baby? So I ran home and I got my laptop, and I sat in the lobby of that hotel for about the next 48 hours, connecting people to the Red Cross database. And what I saw in that exercise was, first of all, an extremely human and humbling experience to be sitting with a complete stranger across the table from someone you don't know, and um, really on the worst day of their life, and giving them a little bit of hope. And what happened was, as I entered their names into the database and said, you know, if your family's looking for you, they're going to be able to find you. They're going to know you're in Dallas. And let's look and see if we can find anybody in your family. And we would look for people in their family. And the sense of peace and tranquility and the look in their eyes that would come over them as they saw that members of their family were safe but maybe dislocated in another city um, was amazing. And it just made me think about Digital taking away proximity. It doesn't matter where you are, it matters who you are. And that was my first lesson in how digital is going to change the way we think about humanity. The second in my series of experiences and lessons was something much closer to home when my daughter was diagnosed with a brain tumor at the age of nine years old. What the doctor saw on the inside was a very small tumor that was located exactly in the center of her brain, actually really small, and you would think it wasn't much of a problem. But after meeting with 45 or 50 different doctors, what we had learned was it was the equivalent of landing a 777 in downtown Manhattan, an extremely high real estate area that was virtually impossible to navigate. What I saw on the outside as her mother at the end of her illness was a girl who couldn't see, was paralyzed on her right side, couldn't be touched, couldn't control her heart rate, couldn't control hunger or thirst, she had none, couldn't control her body temperature. The place where her tumor is located is actually the center of your spirituality and your connection in some religions and some belief systems, they call it your third eye. And she had hallucinations about speaking with spiritual leaders. <clears throat> what we learned after meeting with a pediatric oncologist was that he said, I would have that out of my daughter in a week. So. We didn't know what to do because we'd learned that it was about a 10% survival rate for any type of surgery, a traditional surgery, and it was um, she would have to relearn to walk, relearn to talk, all of, those, all of those things. And so 
um, we just went on a crusade to save our daughter's life. We said, you know, we're going to die trying. And so I searched on the internet and found a doctor who had created this revolutionary new surgery. Actually, it didn't even exist when she uh, was first diagnosed. And we decided to go for it. And I started sharing that experience in social media because I was frankly just exhausted from having one-on-one -on -one conversations, as you can imagine, about a topic that was devastating. The next thing that happened actually was just a series of miracles and gifts that came to me through the digital space. Things like one of my friends who I went to high school with called, or sorry, messaged me and said, you know, I know I haven't seen you in 20 years, but I see what your family's going through. I would love to help. I don't have any money or other you know, resources I could give you, except that I'm extremely organized. Can I help you plan all of your travel and all of your itineraries and just logistics? Oh my God, yes. I didn't even realize that was a problem I had. Yes, that would be amazing. The second was one of my colleagues, him and his wife, gifted us the miles that we needed just to fly to Los Angeles um, to have the surgery that eventually saved my daughter's life. On August 2nd, 2011, the greatest miracle of all happened. She had this revolutionary new surgery. The doctor was amazing. 12 hours after surgery, she was up doing the electric slide in the hallway with the physical therapist. Four weeks later, she was cheering at a football game. Five weeks later, she was nationally ranked in a regatta. So it truly was a miracle. <clears throat> Another gift came to us when my sister's boyfriend from high school called and said, I'm a, pi I'm a pilot for a corporation and I can help you coordinate a private plane to fly home so you don't have to fly home um, through LAX with a, a child that just had brain surgery. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. So we flew home and basically the war was over and we'd won. So as you can imagine, that was a huge life shift because we'd spent three or four years of literally five days a week in a doctor's office life or death, not knowing what was going to happen one day from the next. And so it was just a haze. But finally, about six months later, I looked up, and I had been running a digital agency at that time, and I noticed that every single one of the pieces of work that we were doing was about a children's cause. They were all cause-oriented, and they were all philanthropy. So it's like subconsciously, I think I'd kind of drifted towards this thing as far as helping children in the world. And I knew that if my network of people could save one child... 500 people in my network, what could a brand with 6 million people or 10 million people do? There shouldn't be th hunger. There shouldn't be thirst. There shouldn't be illiteracy. There shouldn't be abuse. None of those things should exist, exist in our world anymore. Um, and I believe that. And I felt like it was my job to make that happen. And I really became exhausted. I ended up doing a ton of work for United Way. I was on a team that got Volunteer of the Year, Children's Literacy, all of these different things. I had a huge consciousness in my social network of helping people. One of my friends passed away unexpectedly, and we raised money for her son to get adopted. Um, saw somebody that was bullied online and raised money for them to go on vacation. So all of these different things. And I just started wondering about, you know, is this real? I mean, are, are, is this just a fad that people are helping each other, or what's going on? So I started thinking about it, and I, I've always said that the digital space is really um, just a materialization and a view and kind of like a scrapbook of the real world. So you can't have things existing in social media if it doesn't exist in real life. You don't have sh stories of your children to share and whatnot if they're not there. So I wanted to do research about how people interacted with their friend networks. No digital, no social, none of that. So I started looking at research, and I found things that, <laughs> studies that had been back in the 1800s um, about how women and men work differently with their friend groups. And what I saw was that women tend and befriend. So what that means is that a complex problem-solving situation, you're, uh, if you're a woman, you're probably going to do something like this, emotional support. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry to hear that that happened. I love you. I'm praying for you, all those things. Tangible support, which would be like, okay, I picked up your dry cleaning, I made your family dinner, and I walked your dog. Or you would do something like expert support, which is what happened to me a lot. None of my children have ever had a brain tumor, but my sister's cousin's boyfriend's hairdresser's niece's aunt had a brain tumor. So I'm going to connect you with them, and they can tell you what they went through. Men, on the other hand, do something that's fight or flight. So let's say you're a guy, and one of your buddies is getting divorced. You'd be like, man, do we need to go kick somebody's ass? Because I will. Fight. <laughs> or you would be like this dude, call me when your divorce is over and we'll go grab a beer. Flight. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about them anymore. 
Um, so, basi <laughs> so basically what I found was that um, when this tending and befriending and when this complex problem solving happens, it actually creates a neurological response that is something that relaxes you, makes you feel serene and tranquil, makes you happy. So I was so thrilled and overjoyed to find that because I'm like, oh, this has nothing to do with digital. This has nothing to do with social. This has to do with people and how we were made and how we were programmed. And the lesson in that was, you know, you, it's not that you cognitively want to help someone. Inside you, you have to help someone. You're made to help. It makes a response in you that you want. So the third in my series of lessons is one that I had more personal impact on. It all kind of came out of this really light dinner conversation. And um, basically what I was thinking is, again, if all of these things are happening because it's programmed inside us, what ha what's going to happen? What's the world going to be like when all of these hard problems are solved? And the only thing that's left are things that are not a crisis, right? What if it was just something like, you know, fun? So the first, experiment, per first step in the experiment, I was like, I'm going to do something for somebody in the family. Okay, we have a five-year-old that wants a cat desperately, but she like starts sneezing when you say the word cat, right? So she's so allergic, you don't even know, you can't even talk about it. So we needed a, um, we needed a, a hairless cat. So I put it out there and said, who's got a hairless cat? Six weeks later, I have three hairless cats, <laughs> Lucille Bald, Dosita, and Scarlett Nohara. And by the way, <laughs> last night when I'm saying, I was having kittens, getting ready for my TED Talk. Dosita had kittens last night. Stephen and Alec Baldwin have been born so far. Billy's still on his way. <laughs> so anyway, the next thing I did is, let's do something for our family. So we went, and just after a couple of glasses of wine, I said, I wish I had a sailboat for our family to go sailing on, spend time together, make memories. We've had all this crisis. We want to do something fun. A month later, I get a text from buddies, somebody that says, hey, do you still want this sailboat? Because it'd do me as big a favor as it would you if I could just give it to you. Okay, next thing you know, we're out on the lake. Then I thought, I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to do something for me, someone else, my family. I'm going to do something for myself. I put it out in my network. I am only going to work things on, passionate, on things I'm passionate about for the rest of my life. I started talking to everyone about it. I'm putting it out there in my groups and Facebook and whatnot. I run into my old boss. I'm like, hey, man, did you know that I'm going to only work on things that I'm passionate about? He goes, what's that? I said, I'm not sure yet, but I know for sure that when I figure it out, that's all I'm going to work on. So I was talking to my current boss, and I was, we were talking about different things going on, and she said she had an initiative called Passion Projects that she loved some leadership on. And so I was just laughing inside when we started talking about it because I'm thinking, that is what I've been calling this thing inside myself. And so actually I started doing a lot of the research that I was talking to you about in lesson two. And then what happened was one of my friends, I was talking to him about Passion Projects, and he said, that'd be a great TED Talk. My wife's curating speeches for the TED Talk. Why don't you come do a TED Talk? Next thing you know, here I am, right? So the lesson in all of that is people say life is short, but life is long. It's extremely long. So be happy and do what makes you happy. Know what you want and ask for it. So um, finally, I'd like to say that the 28 days, 52 hours, and or two hours and 52 minutes that I spent in social media was not wasted. It was time very well spent. And um, I was sitting and talking to my daughter about what she wants to be when she grows up. And the exciting news is that she's growing up and we're having this conversation. I said, make sure you work on something you're passionate about. Do something that you love. If you love to sail, you can work doing that. You can work surfing. Do whatever. And I started telling her about all these great experiences that had happened to me. And I said, you know what? Maybe God's in the internet. All my prayers have been answered. But really, it's just all of us connecting and doing what we were meant to do. So the three lessons I'd love to leave everyone with are, number one, it doesn't matter where you are, it matters who you are. Number two, you're biologically programmed to help people. You have a moral obligation to help people that are in a worse off situation than you. But you also are going to feel good about it. There's reciprocity in it. And number three is, people say life is short, but life is long. So know what you want and ask for it. Thank you so much for listening to my story.